Jadi ibu akan suruh Kelas di belakang آه طيب آه مساء الخير انا ابراهيم مسعد آه والنهارده هنتكلم على سي تي اف باك باونتي اند بروفيشنال ورك اعتقد انا شايف نفسي دلوقتي لايف ف ممكن استنى بس لحد ما حد يكتب اي كومنت ولا حاجه عشان اتاكد ان مش انا بس انا الوحيد اللي شايف نفسي فلو حد بس موجود اونلاين ممكن يكتب على يوتيوب اي حاجه آه اوكي ماشي آه، طيب انا ممكن آه، طيب اعتقد خلاص انا جالي مسج ان انا لايف آه، طيب هنبدا دلوقتي آه، زي ما قلت لكم البرزنتيشن النهارده هيتكلم على سي تي اف باك باونتي والعلاقه ما بينهم سي تي اف اللي هي كابتشر ذا فلاك كومبيتيشنز ده الناس اللي ما تعرفهاش وباك باونتي آه، اللي هو آه، ان انت لو بتجيب باجز في شركه والشركه دي بتعمل لك ريورد باك آه، ففي البرزنتيشن ده آه، هتكلم كمان ان انجلش عشان احنا مش عارفين الناس هتسمعنا منين في ممكن لو حد معاي لينك ومش مش مش من العالم العربي فهبدا اتكلم بالانجلش uh, طيب ف good afternoon everyone my name is Ibrahim uh, and today I'll, get, I'll speak about CTF's bug bounty and professional work we'll speak about the CTF's history how they started uh, bug bounty history and how they started what are the big players in the bug bounty uh, field or area similarly with the CTF's Uh, and then we'll speak about the relation between bug bounty, CTFs, and professional work. How bug bounty and CTFs can help you in your professional work or can, can help you to find a job. And when they might harm you not to, and, and also make, make it difficult for you uh, to, to, to find a job. Uh, I'll first start with who am I? Uh, my name is Ibrahim uh, Mossad. Uh, I have been working in the field for around uh, more than seven to eight years. Uh, as professional work, uh, I, I worked with different roles. So I worked as a pen tester, uh, a red teamer. I worked as a security engineer. Uh, I also worked for different companies. So I worked for uh, EGCERT. Uh, I worked for QCERT. I worked for a company called Secforce in, in, in the UK, London. I worked for Deloitte. And now I'm, I'm, I'm part of Facebook uh, security team uh, in London. I've been working with them for, uh, for more than three years. Uh, I've also played CTFs uh, for around six years. Uh, I played CTFs. I think I participated in the first CTF that was uh, created in Egypt, uh, which was uh, by Cyber Talents. And I, I, I participated in a lot of CTFs. I play with a, a team called uh, LCBC. Uh, it's a Russian and me and a couple of other guys are Egyptian in that team. Uh, I've also participated in, in Bug Bounty. So. Uh, For five, for around five years, uh, I've, I've played the in uh, participated into bug bounty, and I found different bugs and different websites. So most of the presentation today is not theoretical or not something that uh, I have not uh, tried before firsthand. So most of the experience that I will be sharing with you today are firsthand experience, things that I've tried already. I've worked as a pen tester, I've worked as a security engineer, I've worked in different companies. I did CTFs and bug bounty before and during me working into these uh, companies. So mostly will be how how everything played out uh, together and how would I give someone the advice to, to go through the same path I, uh, I went or what are the, the learned lessons uh, through the same path uh, I went. So let's start with a quick outline of, of the presentation. So we we'll start with CTFs. What, what are CTFs? Uh, what, What do we mean by CTFs? What is the history of CTFs? What are the, the big teams? And then we'll move into bug bounty. And then in the last part, we'll focus about CTFs, bug bounty, and the career, uh, how everything plays out together. Um, and last part, we'll end up with questions. So you can ask on YouTube. Uh, and I have also a list of questions that people have been asking over the last couple of days, uh, and I can use them. Uh, so let's start with, with CTFs. With, with capture the flag competitions. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I cannot interact with people and there is a lag already. So, but I wanted to ask first if you know when was the first CTF that was played. Uh, if you hear this, feel free to, to write on, on the YouTube channel. Uh, so if you know when is the first CTFs that was ever played and how did that look like? Uh, unless Until you find an answer for this, I will go first through the definition. So uh, for CTFs, it's basically uh, a competition, a uh, computer security competition, where participants are expected to solve security challenges uh, or computer security challenges. So you have, let's say, a website, and then in this website, you're trying to read uh, uh, some files that you're not expected to read. Uh, let's say this website is a bank, then you're trying to transfer money that uh, more than what you have in your account. Or if this website, let's say uh, uh, e Gmail, uh, then you're trying to access an email of another person that you don't have access to or you don't know their passwords. So CTFs are these kind of uh, challenges, but they are kind of very well-defined challenge and scope, and you're trying to solve this challenge. Once you solve this challenge, uh, then you know uh, you, you you get points and you move into the next uh, next challenge. So this is the definition. And then back to when was the first CTF that was created? So the first CTF was in 1996, around 24 years old, and it's uh, it's a Def, it's DevCon CTF. So DevCon is the biggest or one of the biggest security conferences uh, that are held every year in the United States. DevCon is considered like the the master of uh, of of, of uh, uh, conferences and it's the master of uh, CTFs. So the first one was in 1996, uh, and uh, it was very trivial. Basically, it was uh, the participants. They had some ac access to a terminal, and what they 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 tried to do is that to print or access the terminal of another user. So let's say you have ten participants. Each one of them has a had a terminal, and then they try to access the terminal of other users. Uh, this 1996. That's like 24 year, years old, I was, I think, four years or five years old back then. So, but then CTFs were not very, very popular back then because no one was very familiar with the, with the field. No one was very familiar with, with anything, basically. Uh, and in 2010, it started to appear more, uh, like it started to go viral and people to know more about it and they started to play it. So there is a lot of, not a lot of history documented between 1996 and 2010 other than DEFCON. They uh, they organized the CTF every single year from 1996 to 2010. So mainly it was DEF CON only, but no other big uh, uh, conferences. I know KS Computer Club. This is this is a, a, a like a conference in uh, in Germany. They they are organizing the biggest CTF in in Europe, and I think they've been doing this since 2000, 2008. They had before that some some sort of CTF, but that was not like inviting everyone or, or everything uh, so that's kind of the history and after that so yeah okay so now we know what ctfs and we know uh when did they start what is the format looks like so the ctf basically it's time boxed so you have around four hours uh, sorry you have around uh, 48 hours or 24 hours so one day or two days usually over the weekend uh, the company or the organization or the university that's holding the CTFs, it releases the challenges uh, and then teams participate during these 48 hours. So the team that solves the most number, the, the, the number of challenges that gets you the maximum point through the 48 hours or 24 hours is the winning team. Uh, usually CTFs have qualification and finals. Uh, so you play the qualifications online and then if you win, then the companies or universities will invite you to the final rounds uh, there. So a couple of examples uh, we have in the in the Arab uh, or, or in the region, we have cyber talents. You have an online CTF, which is a qualification. And then you have a final round where you actually go to the place and play the CTFs. A lot of CTFs are in this style. You have um, uh, online round that's qualification and then a final round that is on site uh, for the CTF. The online qualification, the size, uh, CTFs is a team game, so you're not expected to play CTFs on your own. You're planning to uh, play CTFs with the team. So on the online qualification, the number of teams, it's not limited. It's very, it's, it's very, very difficult to limit that. So usually you have very big teams playing the online qualifications and usually the challenges are, are a lot. But the finals, the expectation between the numbers between four, four to eight people, depending on the CTF. Some people, some CTF said the number to five, five, uh, five players on the team, and other sets to eight players on the team. And 
I enjoy when when they travel you around and you get to see new new countries and uh, new places. I've I've been I've traveled to different CTFs uh, and I really enjoy uh, the experience. So okay, we're speaking about capture the flag or CTFs. Uh, so one of the questions is like, okay, what is the flag looks like? You know, you mentioned you have a challenge, you have a website, you're trying to get to read an uh, email of another user. What does this flag look like? And that I if I if I solve the challenge, I know okay, this is my flag. Uh, so uh so the flag is again for people who are not very familiar with ctf so it's just a piece of string uh that you find when you solve the challenge so if we with if you continue with the example of gmail where you try to get access to the someone else's email then if you got if you manage to find a, a security vulnerability and you got access then you will probably read an email with a string that contains the flag usually they have a specific format so usually they have the uh the company or the, the the conference name and then square brackets or curly brackets and then some random text there so it's difficult to 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 guess and uh and it's a, it's, it's long enough and it's difficult to to, to guess so uh so examples for you is tmctf you have tmctf and then square brackets uh and then some 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 numbers and then you have dcctfs uh again which is defcon ctf uh curly brackets and then some numbers but this is not necessarily uh, true or not necessarily like the flag does not have to exactly to be the same as this text. Uh, you, it can be any text or it can be a group of words that you solve throughout the CTF and you, you concatenate them together uh, and then you, uh, you, 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 you that, that's your flag and you, then you get your points. Uh, okay, so we know CTFs, we know their history. Uh, what are their types? Uh, so there are, there are two different types for CTFs. There's something called Jeopardy and there's something called Attack and Defense. Uh, if you have played CTFs before, you're pr probably familiar with each uh, type, but I'll explain each of them uh, clearly. So for the Jeopardy style, uh, basically you have different categories. So you have Pro and Mobile Web, Forensics, Reverse Engineering Network, any type of categories. Usually any CTFs have around five to four categories. They are not the same categories every time. So if you play DEF CON, they have their own categories, which is one of like four or five of these, but other other uh, other companies that have their own categories. So some companies have net, uh, network and others have binaries. Uh, other have also, there's a category called miscellaneous when you create uh, a challenge and you don't know which category is this, but it, it re it's related to security, to security, uh, to security and information security. Then you just add it in the miscellaneous uh, category. There is also uh, uh, coding. Some CTFs have coding categories, so you need to write code to solve a coding problem or a coding challenge, which is part of the, the the security engineer role as well, which we will see later. So you have categories. Every category has a set of tasks. And then you just try to go over these tasks and get the flag, which we explained uh, in a bit. And then the team who wins, <coughs> who solves most of the challenges, they will probably get most points and then they win the competition. So it's very simple. There are no teams attacking each other. You have a set of challenges that are online for, for 24 hours or 48 hours. You go through into each challenge, into each category, and then you try to solve these and get points. Uh, as I mentioned, CTFs is a team effort or a team game and that's why that's why you have like Pwn mobile web you have different categories usually in your team you have people who are focused on web and mobile for example they focus on them and they try to find the security bugs there other people who are very familiar with forensics and reverse engineering and other people who are be very familiar with let's say reverse engineering and Pwnable so you would have some people in your team or players in your team that are very very good at one or two or sometimes three fields and then this is how you form the team uh so this is the uh dashboard for google ctf uh so you can see here uh there are different challenges each challenge have its own score and i think the number on the left probably with the number of teams who solve that challenge uh and you have the different categories and under each category you have the different types so one of the categories here is cryptography uh which you have five or uh, yeah, these are six challenges there and the number of points and the number of teams who solve that. Uh, that and then you have web, you have reversing and you have ponables. Uh, so each category has its own, uh, we will speak also about each category, what does it mean and what are you expected to do in, in each category. Uh, the, the, one of the interesting things before moving on is, is the scoring system. Uh, 
so over history, CTF started with uh, the task or the challenge creator or the organizers, they write challenges and they say, okay, I think this is easy, so I will put 50 points. I think this is difficult, so I will put 500 points. Usually the, the challenges points between 100 to 500 or 50 to, to, to 500, 1000 so, uh, sometimes, but usually it's between these numbers. Uh, so they were static core drops because it means it's easier. And this is one of the fairest uh, ways to, to score uh, to, 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 to score on CTFs. So there was also another types of scoring systems where uh, you have challenges and if you solve them early, you get a uh, bonus. But I really don't like this because when you create the CTFs, you don't know if you're creating this. You don't know who is wake up now. You are creating something online every some people might be asleep, some people might be awake, so you don't know who is available. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't make sense to give bonus to people who are wake up now and they are ready to, 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 to participate. This is another dashboard for another CTF called Internet Wage. Uh, and uh, again, you have different categories uh, and you have crypto, you have reversing here, you have code and you have exploit, which uh, so code, I think, is the new category that did not exist uh, in uh, Google CTF. And again, you can find a lot of CTFs and a lot of categories. Okay, moving into jumping into each category. So let's start with pawnable or binary or exploit. What does this category mean? So this is one of the categories that I really like and I love. Uh, so it's uh, you have a service or you have some binary running on the organizer's machine. So they run some binary or some service. This binary or service uh, it's usually written in a native language, so it's written in C and C++. Uh, sometimes you have access to it, so they give you the binary. They do not give you the source code. They just give you the binary. And what you want to get is the flag. That is, that, that's the challenge. There's a service running, you have the binary of that service, and you want to get the flag. The methodology usually is that, okay, I want to break out of the service. I want to find a vulnerability on this service. And then I want to, to exploit that on the organizer machine. And usually the flag will be in a file on the system. Or once I get access to the system and I can run any command, getting the flag would be something uh, straightforward usually. So uh, if we think of what skills this gives you, so like you need to reverse engineer the binary, uh, you need to find bugs in this binary, and you need to write exploits for this bug. So these are the different three ways, like these are the different skills that you need to solve these type of challenges. Uh, so how does it look like? It eventually looks like something like this. So this is one of the CTFs that I was uh, playing and it eventually looks like something something like this. So basically you have uh, a, ch a service that you connect to. What's your favorite number? And then you can see here I have entered hello AAA some some stuff, uh, which is my, my, shell, uh, my, my uh, shell code. And then eventually you get access. You can run any command. So I run ID, you can see anything. And then you look for the flag. So I did ls you look for the flag you find a file called flag.txt which is readable only by pwn 75 which is the challenge that i was solving and then if you read that uh, you get the flag again another example uh, here uh, which you have a service you connect to you write something you get the flag uh, for those of you who have been in the industry for five or six years uh, this is a question you can answer at the end or you can write on the youtube channel do you know what bug is this? This something was very, very popular. And from the exploit, you should be able to know what bug is this or yeah, like it should ring a bell. Uh, if, if you have not been around for five or six years or you don't familiar with this bug, just try to search. Uh, maybe if you, if you can copy paste the, 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 the exploit uh, and, and search for that. <clears throat> Again, this is another example. This is for, I think for uh, for DevCamp, which is a challenge, uh, CTFs you see here, I connect to the, uh, to the, I cat the solution, which has everything. And then I connect, I netcat to charles.camptf.cc.ac on that specific port where the challenge is working and I get the flag. Uh, again, this is a more complex example. Uh, you see here, so there's an exploit, I write exploit smooth, uh, I, I, I execute this exploit, which I have written. Uh, and this was one of the CTFs called CSAO, which is I really like. And then you can see there is a service that you allow you to uh, create contact, remove contact, either contact or display contacts. And some magic happens uh, and I have the exploit and eventually get the flag. So these are the pawnable category. It's one of the categories that I really like and one of the categories I they are very close to my heart. Uh, because I like the creativity and 
how from 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 reverse in, from reverse engineering the challenging the challenge finding the security bug and making and writing the exploit and make sure that everything works and what's so, something interesting about the CTF is that you can know everything theoretically but in the CTF that you need to put everything together you actually need to write the exploit and the exploits have to work for you to get this to to get the uh, to, to get the flag so even if you were like oh i was very very close and it didn't work it just didn't work you have to figure it out and for everything to work okay so moving on to from this category uh we have the web category which is and the other category that I'm, i really like and also it it helped me a lot throughout my career uh so so the expectation similar to the native or the pointable you have a web application so it's a different set of skill set you have a web application that you are trying to attack and again you're trying to get the flag the flag is usually again it's either a file in the system it's either part of the web application so if we think of the gmail example it's in, in the email if you think of a bank account then maybe you need to transfer or to have uh some amount of your balance uh so that you can uh buy the flag for example and there is no way or no easy way to put this balance so depending on the challenge the flag could be in different places but the methodology is usually the same you try to find a security bug on the web so xss rce sql injection some security bug that will help you to find the flag or to reach the flag and then once you find this bug you try to exploit so the skill set here is different if you try to whereas a native you were focusing on native application and native security here you are focused more on web security and the type of the bugs in web security and the exploits is different there is no reverse engineering so things are different and it's a completely different skill set than native uh so okay how does it look like so it looks like something like this you have a web application so this is one of the ctfs called uh i don't know how to pronounce it but maybe insomnia hack or something like this so it's one of the really really good ctfs uh i really love it and i recommend you to try it out so you have this application which eventually i had an exploit something something and i have the flag in front of me again the flag looks like the ctf name and you, the, the flag uh, value there so uh another website or another uh, challenge uh was again you can see here this is a website that was i think for page for photo uploading and i had some exploit or i found a bug that i can i can read any file in the system and finding the flag uh should be straightforward from there so this how it looks like uh, the, the job pretty style and the web and the native flag, uh, the, the, the native category. Uh, reverse engineering, again, I do reverse engineering, but I have not been playing a lot of reverse engineering. I do it part of the Pwnable, so I don't have a lot of screenshots here. Uh, but it's mostly about you have an application and then you are trying to reverse engineer what does this application do and you try to get the flag. Usually the challenge is that you don't need to connect to a server or anything, you just have a binary that let's say asks you for a password and if you enter this password it will give you the flag think of a uh, a game if you download a game and then it asks you to register or to buy this game if you buy this game then you they will give you like the activation code uh so imagine if you know and then once you give the, the activation code you can play the full version of the game so reverse engineering is about something similar to this uh where you have a binary that you want to pass some password or passphrase passphrase and then you get the uh, the flag uh, again, they're very cool and uh, I, I do like them a lot, but I like to play them part of the portable. Last thing is the we have forensics, which is one of the interesting challenges as well. So uh, I, I, I did play this as well. I don't have a screenshot though for it. So uh, you have a memory dump, you have a disk dump, you have a network capture or some file format and you try to find the flag. So usually the theme is around uh, you have uh, there was some attacker uh, on, on the system that we're doing something uh, malicious or we're doing something that we're not very familiar with. Uh, and here is the memory dump of, of this system. So you have like maybe 16 gigabytes of memory dump from the RAM and then you need to find the flag. Again, it's it's not easy to break down the problem or to know where is the flag, but you try to kind of stitch things together and you try to build that theme. So maybe look into the processes that were open during this, uh, when, when the capture was, uh, was, uh, was, was, was got and uh, find what are the different application, what if, what are the fishy application or the application that were malicious, what, what files that they were working with, etc. So try to work out this and the skill set is completely different here. The skill set is you understand file formats, you understand uh, 
where our things are stored in file, how can you retrieve a deleted file? So you can think of the flag as a file that was deleted, and then we give you a disk image. How can you recover that deleted file? So the skill set is completely different here. Uh, the methodology, again, depends. If you're working with a network capture, if you're working with a disk image, depending on that, so you understand how the network capture works, how things go through the network, and how can you find the flag over the network. So let's say the 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 malicious file was connecting through uh, the CNC to the back server, to the back end, uh, uh, and they're sending some encrypted information. So again, things can become uh, very ugly, but the uh, the beautiful way. So the last category I'll mention is the crypto, which I'm not very good at. I can understand crypto, but I'm not very good at solving CDF challenges. And uh, it's very simple. You have an encrypted piece of code, and then you're trying to decrypt it. You don't know what's the encryption, you don't know what's the key, but do your magic and you will decrypt it if you have enough skills. Uh, so these are the main categories for uh, the Jeopardy and the different types of them with different examples. Uh, Jeopardies are 80% or 90% of the CTF challenges so uh, or the CTF competition. So if you play CTFs, most probably you have played Jeopardy only and you have not played attack and defense, which is the other type that we will speak about now. Uh, so attack and defense is not very, very uh, popular format. Uh, it's, uh, and there are different reasons why it's not very popular. And I'll explain first attack and defense, what are the differences between it and Jeopardy uh, and why it's not very popular. I'll explain this in, at the end. So attack and defense actually have two uh, formats. Uh, so some people also call it war games uh, because you are attacking different machines. So it has two formats. The first format is the standard format where you have machines running services. Uh, so you and then you try to attack the service and defend it. So every team owns a set of machines. So my team owns one or two machines. So let's so let's say we own uh, a service very similar to Gmail, and then we own another service that's uh, very similar to. Uh, YouTube, for example. Uh, so you are responsible on protecting this web application. So you need to find the bugs there and you need to fix them. Uh, and you also, once you find the bugs, you need to attack the other teams because all the teams have the same set of services. So once you find a bug, you need to fix it in your site and then go attack the other team. Once you attack the other team, you get points, but you also need to maintain persistence on that machine. So you need to keep uh, access to that machine. So the other team will figure out, oh, we have been attacked. They will try to figure out where have you, what did you do into the machine? They maybe uh, re-image the machine or they remove your back door, they fix the bug, and then you, and that's how, how it works. It's very, very nice. Uh, and unfortunately, there is not a lot of uh, CTFs uh, that, that told this format because it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to, to build. So as I mentioned, each team on some services, you defend Keep the service running and attack others. Uh, if someone is asking, okay, like, why I, if I give access to the machine, I just shut down the service because if I shut down Gmail, then no one will be able to attack me because there is no service at all. So cool, that's you can do this, but you will not get any points because there is a bot that will check that your service is running because the goal is basically to make the service running securely, not to shut down the service. <clears throat> all right, so. How does it look like? So it looks like something like this. So we have three teams, uh, and then inside every team you have machine A, machine B, machine C, each team on this machine. Let's assume every team have one single machine for simplicity. And then team A is expected to defend machine A, and then team A is also expected to attack machine B and C. Uh, and then team C, they're expected to defend machine C. Uh, so this is how it looks like. So uh, it's very, as you can see, there is very, uh, like it's very dynamic and different teams attack each other. You are not expected to attack team B machines or like the actual machines of the players. Uh, so these are services that you're expected to attack, but not the actual players, though people do that a lot. And sometimes they get disqual uh, disqualified. The other format of the attack and defense. So uh, DEF CON is one, of the, uh, is one of the CTFs that play this type of attack and defense. Each team have a set of machines they own and try to uh, defend. And I think also, uh, I'll show you examples in a minute. Uh, so there are a couple uh, conferences that, that have attack and defense machines. So the other format is King of the Hill. Uh, so King of the Hill is the other format of the attack and defense. And it's th the difference is that 
every team does not own a set of services, but there are only one set of services. So you have one machine and each team are trying to attack this one machine, but whoever gets in first, they try to defend that machine. And the more you keep ownership of this machine, the more points you get with time. So there is a bot that will check every 15 minutes, for example, or every five minutes to make sure that you have access to this machine, to, have, to make sure that you, you have your identity on this machine. And if that is the case, they will give you more points. Uh, so that is the, uh, you know, the, the, the king of the hell. Uh, and it looks like this. So you have machine A, we have different machines, but machine A, and every team is trying to attack this uh, machine. So now example CTF, so we have DEFCON finals. They're not the qualification round. It's the final rounds when, when they fly you out there and you play there. Trend micro finals, ARP cybersecurity war games. I think ARP cybersecurity war games is uh, the only one in, uh, in, in the Arab region. ICTF, RUCTF. There are not a lot of machine uh, sorry, uh, CTFs that are attack and defense. Uh, so I think this is, there, there will be others, but these are like the ones that are very uh, popular. So let's take a couple of examples. Uh, so Arab cybersecurity war games. Uh, this is a Mexid uh, uh, challenge or competition. Uh, you have Jeopardy and you have attack and defense. Uh, the team size is expected to be from three to five players. It lasts, a, uh, uh, it lasts uh, for two days and you have qualifications and finals. I think the qualifications are Jeopardy only, but the finals are uh, Jeopardy and attack and defense. Uh, I think there are some requirements here where you need one player to be undergraduate uh, for, for cyber security, uh, for cyber war games, uh, the Arab cyber security war games. Uh, again, it's it's uh, attack and defense. I haven't played it, so I'm not sure if it's King of the Hill or uh, uh, or every team owns a set of machine, but I think it's King of the Hell. Uh, feel free to correct me if, if I'm wrong uh, on the YouTube chat. Uh, all right, so Trend Micro, this is the one that I have participated in into for, for two times, and I have won uh, one time in 2017. So it's again mixed, it's Jeopardy and Attack and Defense. Uh, the type of the Attack and Defense is, uh, <clears throat> the type of the Attack and Defense is uh, King of the Hill. So you have a set of machines that you own and uh, the size is five players, around five players. You can have, of course, three players, you can have one player, it's, it's up to you, but maximum over five players. It spans across two days, it's usually in, in December and it's just King of the Hill style and the Jeopardy style. Uh, I It's very difficult to show you a live demo or a live example of this, but I have a video of, la uh, of when I played the uh, the trend micro they have a very very fancy dashboard to show you how teams attack uh, the machines and they they gain access of the machines so let's let's play it so uh, let's see how can I play this yeah so here you see like you have EG freaks and the different types of the teams and then the attacking the K1, K2, K3. So K1, K2, 3 are king of the hill 1, king of the hill 2, king of the hill 3. They're attacking these machines and there is also the Jeopardy machines. So this is how it looks like. This is in terms of, I mean, we don't actually send these light bulbs or like, you know, light rays there, but this is us trying to solve the challenge uh, or trying to solve the, uh, the, the challenge. Once you get access to the challenge, uh, then you own that challenge and other teams try to attack you and you try to defend uh, this this challenge. Uh, so this Trend Micro, I've played this with a very good set of folks from Egypt and we won this one. So uh, it's one of the, the competitions that I'm very proud of because there were very, uh, there was very competitive teams. I was actually also playing against my team, LCBC, uh, but because it went out with cyber talents. Uh, so I, I continued with cyber talents. So this one was uh, one of the very cha like challenges that I'm very proud of. Uh, all right, so let's move into what a good CTF look like. Uh, so we understand the CTFs and we understand like their format, their types, uh, examples of them. So a good CTF will require no guessing. So no, like as a, the, the, the attacker or the person who's trying to solve the challenges, guessing should not be part of the solution uh, because this, this, this is not good, this will not work. Uh, diversity in the categories. So you're expecting the CTF to satisfy everyone uh, that some teams who play web, some, te some, some people who focus on web, some people who focus on native, some people who focus on, on reverse engineering. You're expected the teams to, or, uh, or the CTF to kind of satisfy these uh, 
categories. Uh, fair scoring, as I mentioned, there are different types of scoring. I think the one that is very most common now is the dynamic scoring uh, that adjusts with time. But I really don't like the scoring where you get bonus points if you solve the, the problem first. You, you don't like, uh, or, or the scoring that this is a 500 points, but uh, there was a, a backdoor or there was a way to, to, to find a solution in an easier way. So dynamic scoring works very, very well and it's very, very fair. Stable challenges, also this is annoying for some CTFs where the challenge is always taken down or the challenge is broken. Uh, so this is unfair because some people will play the challenge, they will find a solution uh, and then the challenge is not stable or they will try to DDoS the challenge uh, so the challenge is down for other players. So when you design a CTF, you need to think of this, how the challenge can be stable. And of course, enough time. Again, uh, if you make it, to eight hours and you give me 50 challenges then I don't think I'm going to finish this it's pointless so uh to make to make it like to choose the right set of challenges and the right amount of challenges is very good and satisfying for for all the participants so if you're playing a CTF and you think there's a lot of guessing then it's wrong you're doing they are doing it wrong and you should not be playing the CTF if you're playing a CTF and it's only one category it's not a CTF it's something else I don't know what's the name is if you're playing a CTF and uh, you know, like I would say fair scoring, stable challenges and enough time. Again, these are uh, nuances or things that will annoy you, uh, but uh, it, it will still be a CDF. So, uh, OK, top teams. So who are the top teams that I want to be one of them or I want to be uh, similar to them? So top teams, uh, again, uh, it's easy to judge a top team in the CTF. Like it's very easy to say this person or this is the top team or uh, they are the best team because CTFs have weights. So every also CTF has a weight, which means that how important, how difficult and how important the CTF uh, and the, the, the winner team are the best. It's, it's very easy to judge and very easy to say this person has a very good technical skills because they have solved that CTF uh, and this CTF is well known and popular. So imagine if someone solves the DEFCON CTFs or a team solves the DEFCON CTF, they win this three times or four times in a row. It means that they are very, very good. And also I think like uh, to show you how appreciation and how important the DEFCON CTF is, is that there is something called, I think the black coat, uh, you can Google this or black coat DEFCON CTF, which means that I think if you win the CTF or maybe the, the best player during the CTF, they get the black coat, which means that they can enter the DEFCON, uh, they, they can enter the DEFCON conference for, for free, for, for lifetime, like for always. Uh, so I think it's the black coat or the black uh, black badge. I really can't remember the name, but CTFs is very difficult. It's very easy to to, to, uh, to judge that you're the best person or you're, you're the best team. So some of the best teams we have, you can go to ctf.org where you get the stats. So it shows you every year which teams played which CTFs and who team has like the top top in the world. So these are the some of the teams, PPP, uh, which is a, uh, an American team, Dragon Sector, it's I think it's a Polish team, LCBC, this is the team that I used to play with and uh, they are Russian mix, they have some Egyptians or two. Uh, Trail of Bits team, uh, I don't know where they're from, but they're one of the really good teams. Uh, so again, these are, there are, are other teams, not only these, but the, there are other teams and these are, uh, but, but these are very, very popular and I, I know them as well. So they are one of the best teams that have played, that are playing and they have played CTFs. Uh, top players is different because again, it, the CTF is a team effort, but there were some people that were very, like they're very, very known for, they have a really good reputation and they're crazy. They can solve almost all challenges or they take on the entire CTF on their own. These are some of the names you can Google them. So Geohot, uh, he was, uh, He's very popular. I think he he jailbreak uh, uh, the iOS when he was 13 or 14 years old. He's crazy. Loki Hearted also, he works now for Google Project Zero. He's crazy. Hellman is part of the LCBC group and he has PhD in, 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 in cryptography, but also he can take on a, an entire CTF on, on his own. So these are, again, it's very difficult to judge that they are very good. I have not worked, I have only worked with Hellman and I can guarantee you that he is very good technically, but it's very difficult to judge, but you just know them by your reputation because they solve CTFs on their own. Like uh, I think Jihad has a live stream with him taking on an entire CTF on his own uh, single player. Uh, so that's how you know they are very good. 
So, uh, okay, some questions. Do I need to see a, uh, to a team to play CTFs? You don't have to have a team, but I would recommend you to do it, to have a team so they can you can encourage each other. We talked about what are the best CTFs, how to start playing CTFs. Uh, my advice, start with very easy CTFs. Find something with a low weight, read write-ups, and just pick one or two categories. My advice, pick one category first and focus on that for three or four months. You will start working uh, and, uh, on CTFs. And uh, are they related to real life uh, work bugs? We will answer this later. Okay, uh, now we can go to bug bounty. Uh, so we finished CTF, we can go to bug bounty. Uh, just need, uh, we yeah, uh, we'll take like five seconds break. Uh, cool, so uh, I'm not sure, again, I'm not very good with the live stream thing, but I'm not sure if people are commenting on YouTube or not, uh, but I don't see anything, so. Uh, Please, if, if you see the presentation, just try to comment to make sure that it works. Uh, cool, okay. So we can start with uh, bug bounty. Uh, let's again start with a definition. How, what is bug bounty and how did it start uh, and the different types of bug bounty if there is. So uh, bug bounty, again, it's, it's companies basically are trying to invite everyone in the world to say, so or allow everyone in the world to find bugs in their code and uh, and uh, report these bugs and then they reward them back with money or some uh, swag uh, or something. So uh, again, it's uh, you can think of it as a security challenge where you're trying to find bugs in that website and you report it and you get money back. So usually the products or the companies that they, they offer are software or hardware software like web applications or any services or application that they create. Uh, hardware, for example, mo mobile devices or actual console, Sony, like PlayStation, or TVs now, and like it spans across everything now. Basically any product that the company creates uh, is part of the uh, bug bounty, if they're bu usually it's part of their bug bounty. Okay, how did it start? So yeah, bug bounties are very, very old, which I did not know. Uh, so they started in 1995, uh, one year before CTFs, and the first company that did that was Netscape. Uh, so there is something that's Netscape Bug Bounty, and this is a quote from their uh, their release that they created in 1995. They said, it's a program that rewards users who help Netscape find and report bugs in the beta versions of its security announced Netscape Navigator software. For those of you who were, were not very familiar with Netscape or were not there when Netscape was created, so Netscape is sim is I think it's a browser, I did not use it, but I think it's a browser, uh, something like Google Chrome, and I think it was later became Mozilla, uh, but it's just a web a web browser, and they invited everyone to find bugs and report it in their uh, program, and uh, if you report, you will get your reward. So that was created in 1995. Uh, this is an example, I think, of one of their white hat, uh, like Hall of Fame or Wall of Fame, people who have reported and they will get rewards there. Uh, I think they were paying, yeah, you can see here 50 new winners of either a nifty Netscape Mozilla mug or a snazzy Netscape photo shirt. So uh, you, you did not get a lot of, like money or a lot of money, but you get like swag. So you get a shirt, you get a mug from Netscape, which was something cool back then. And this is a list of some of the people who participated into this bug bounty. Uh, okay, moving on. So in 2002, there's a company called iDefense uh, started a bug bounty. It was a middleman, so it's not a company has a, a, a its own product, but it was a vendor that would say, okay, you can report me any security bugs you see in any vendor, and I will liaison with that vendor. I'll connect you with this vendor, and uh, they will fix the bug, and I will pay you, or that vendor will pay you. I, to be honest, I don't know who exactly pays here, and. Uh, I, I don't understand how it works uh, very much. So, but it was a middleman company between the, the researcher and the vendors. And then moving into 2004, Mozilla said, okay, uh, you need to find bugs in, or if you find bugs in our uh, software, then we reward you back with money. And then Zero Day Initiative in 2005. Uh, so Zero Day Initiative is now owned by Trend Micro. It's very similar to the iDefense, which is a middleman. They ask you to report bugs in any product and then they will connect the vendor and they will, ZDI will pay you the money, not the vendor. Uh, so, and then after that, they become a lot of companies, uh, Pwn2Own uh, in 2007, 
uh, and then Google, Facebook, Bot Crowd, PayPal, HackerOne. Uh, so after 2010, I think like, or even 2000, uh, yeah, 2010, most of the companies uh, just joined in the, the bug bounty stream and there is like everyone creates a bug bounty. Uh, I think Google was the first one for web application and then after that, Facebook, Bot Crowd, uh, PayPal, HackerOne. Uh, two things to mention, Bot Crowd and HackerOne are not, again, they, they are middlemen. They are similar to iDefense, they are similar to ZDI, but uh, they are different in some aspects where they say, these are the programs that we work with. So let's say we, we work with Facebook, we work with Google. If you find bug, you report it through us and we will connect you to them. And Google is the one that's paying the reward or Facebook, but uh, zero day initiative or uh, ZDI are different. You report the bug to them, they pay you the bug and then they work out with a vendor. Uh, I probably they get also money from the vendor, but I, I don't know how it works to be honest. So some examples or like deep dive into some examples. So Facebook, uh, so this is where I work and uh, I have been working also into the bug bounty project in Facebook. Uh, so I have been receiving your reports. If, if you have ever reported something to Facebook, I probably have seen that report. Sometimes I've replied to your reports as well. Uh, and so the, it, it started in 2011. It first started with web applications only. So if you can find anything on the Facebook web application reported to us, we will reward you back with money. Uh, uh, but then expanded to all products. So Facebook, Facebook Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, Oculus, and expanded to also any hardware that we own, uh, Ocul uh, Oculus, uh, like the Oculus hardware, any hardware, any, now we have the portal device, any device that Facebook creates. And even further last year, it expanded to third party applications. And you can read our announcement about this, which is very, very cool. So if you find an application or a third party application that works with Facebook, so you know, when you log in, let's say log in with Expedia to Facebook. And if you find a bug in Expedia that allow you in, in a passive way, and this is a very tricky keyword, in a passive way to attack other Facebook users, you can report this and we will pay you, uh, we will reward you uh, back. And we, we, we do pay very good amounts so for, for a minimum bounty and for the maximum bounty, we don't have a limit. So we paid more than 6 million since the, uh, the start of the bug bounty. I think even the number is more now. Uh, so we paid more than 6 million when, when we started this uh, bug bounty. Another company, which is Apple and uh, again, it's a uh, similar uh, to, to Facebook. They have their own website, but they are also focused on their devices, which is the iPhone device or the Apple Watch or any devices that they create. And they also uh, send the uh, uh, to the researchers uh, 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 like free devices for them to test on these devices and find uh, security bugs there. And then they reward them back. I, I think their maximum reward is $1 million. So if you find... Uh, a very critical bug on the iPhone device, you can get 1 million uh, in reward. Uh, I think also the Apple Watch, you probably can get the same, slightly less because the impact is less. Uh, and last thing is ZDI, which I mentioned, they act as a middleman between the researcher and the vendor. ZDI is the, uh, Trend Micro is the one that pays you the money uh, and it covers any product. So Facebook and Apple, they cover their own product. ZDI covers any product, as long as you can tell them that this is impactful and this is, uh, you know, like it affects a lot of people. Uh, so this is the the, the different uh, the, like the different companies and the bug bounty. Okay, how it works. Uh, so it's usually something like this. Uh, you are the attacker. Uh, you try to use the product. So let's say you're trying on Facebook. You try to use the products. You try to find bugs in the products, and then uh, you report to Facebook. So you say, okay, I found this XSS bug here. And this is how to reproduce. So you need to specify how to reproduce the bug. You need to write what is the impact of this bug? Why do you think this is an important security bug? So you can say, uh, if I send this link to the victim and they click on the link, I can take over their account or I can read their messages. Uh, so you need to justify the impact and the reproduction steps and you can attach a video or something uh, when reporting. And then what Facebook does or what we do is that we take your report we try to make sure, okay, can we actually reproduce the issue? Uh, and if we can reproduce and then we ask, okay, what's the impact of this? What's the full impact of this to make sure that too? Because we only reward our, and all other bug bounty programs reward on the first person who report this issue, only the first person that reports this issue. So we check the originality of, of, of the report and then we fix it. And then after that, we reward you back with money. Uh, 
So sometimes also if the fix is long or if the fix will take a lot of time, we might reward you before fixing. And I think there are other companies that are just doing this now. Also, there are different types of paying. Some companies will give you half of the amount before the fix once you once they are able to validate uh, and then half of the amount after the fix. So they do the reproduction, duplicate, deduplication, check originality, and then they pay you half. And then after they fix, they pay you the other half. Uh, so this is how it works. So if, you, so if you're someone who want to try bug bounty, uh, go for it. You have Google, you have Facebook, try to find a security bug, make sure to understand, to justify why it's a security bug. And then after that, report it and uh, you, will get, you will get rewarded. Uh, how it looks, uh, it looks like this. So these are some of the, re the, the emails, uh, like when I submitted bug bounties. So it says, hi, nice catch. Uh, I have, so this is worse to Google. So I send them the, the bug and then they reply, hey, nice catch. I filed the bug based on your report. And uh, we will discuss how much uh, uh, we we're gonna reward you back. Uh, how it looks on the technical side. So uh, this is an example. So this is, was one of the PayPal uh, bug bounty programs where I have I actually executing commands on, on their server. So this is an RCE bug. Uh, so this is a screenshot that I sent to them and then they reply back with, okay, we, we validated the bug, we can reproduce and uh, uh, thank you. And they will reward me back with money. Uh, this is a, again, another uh, company that's called Telekom, uh, Deutsche Telekom, which is a Germany company that has a bug bounty. Again, this is where you can read any file on the system uh, and and they reply, thank you very much. We checked your vulnerability report and it complies with our bug bounty. We want to reward you with, with this amount. And as you can see, like this means that they validated the issue. They can understand the risk and the impact of this issue. I am the first one who reported this issue and that's why the report is valid. And then they later reply on uh, with money. Okay, uh, or with a reward, it does not have to be money. So, okay, what is a good bug bounty program? program? We talked about what is good uh, C what is a good CTF? What is a good bug bounty program? So uh, you can think of as 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 a researcher or someone who participates into bug bounty, you can think of like three or four aspects that will help you to kind of evaluate the bug bounty program. So you can think of time to triage, how long it takes them to say, yes, it's a valid bug. If it takes them one week, two weeks, maybe it's fine. Uh, if it takes them one month, two months or three months, that is not fine. Time to reward. So when are they going to pay you uh, back or reward you back? Because this is the actual reward that you're looking for. Uh, so uh, if it takes one year, this is very, very annoying. If it takes uh, one day, it's great. Uh, and it's usually something in between like, uh, and what's their type, reward type system? Is it also like they are paying half and half or do they pay everything at the end? When Bug Bounty started, they paid everything at the end. Uh, but now there are different types. The time to fix, this is not very important, but it depends on the time of the reward. So this can be related to the time of the reward. If you're only getting uh, paid after the reward, then this is important for you. Also the minimum bounty. So maybe you will be participating in a bug bounty program and they don't pay anything. So if you're focusing on the, 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 the financial reward, then this is not for you. Uh, the scope, also some, some programs, you, they have a very limited, very, very limited scope. Maybe it's not something that you're looking for and you're looking for something that everything that this company owns, which makes the problem is slightly easier. Uh, so all these are uh, different ways to, you know, uh, to reward a bug bounty program and to know if this bug bounty program is good, bad, uh, or should I participate in that or should not I participate in that? Okay. Uh, Researchers. So we talked about the top teams in, 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 in CTFs. Bug Bounty, it's usually not a team effort. Uh, it's rarely a team effort, but it's it's a, it's an individual effort and could be like a couple working together uh, on, on a specific bug, but it's usually an individual effort. Uh, it's, it's very tricky to understand what is a top researcher uh, because you can find bugs at Facebook or you can find bugs at Google, but the criticality or the, the like, you found it because you're the first one who, who looks into that issue, but not because you're technically very, very, very strong. Uh, so it's very difficult to know if a researcher is a top researcher or not, unless you see the write-up. If they say, this is the type, this is the bugs that I found, and this is my write-up, this is the, the, the how I find this bug, then you can judge of, 
are they technically very, very strong or are they the first one who found this issue? Uh, because I can guarantee you, I have participated in bug bounty and some of the bugs that I found and many of the bugs that I found, which again, I did not write write-ups before because they, they're not gonna benefit the world with anything, are the ones that are very straightforward, are, uh, you know, you run Burp Suite, you look into this subdomain that no one has looked before uh, on it and then you find a security bug. So it's, you get rewarded. So there is not a lot of, technicality but some researchers has a different type so uh so these are the different examples like how do you define a top researcher is it number of submissions is it their signal so when they report something it's always a valid or is it their creativity that they can break things no one thought that they are broken or no one like you know think of breaking them so uh i i kind of i categorize the researchers into two types uh the first type are the snipers so the snipers are the researchers who uh, they research. So let's say they, okay, uh, they see uh, all the bug bounty pro programs, for example, use a software called FFmpeg, for example, to, to, to do, uh, or, uh, or image magic to do, uh, to work with images and videos. So they transcode videos or they convert images. So they research into that and see how they can break it. Uh, they find bugs in the technology. So they break image magic or they break, uh, FFmpeg, and then they find all the bug bounty programs that are affected with that, and they uh, they report this uh, to them. So uh, there are there are a lot of researchers that are focused focused on this approach. And example from them, these are some of the the, the players or some of the top researchers. So uh, Michael Batweski, uh, he found he has a lot of write ups, so you can read them. He focuses on the in bug bounty. I think he plays CTFs as well. He focuses in, in bug bounties though, and he tried to break things, which is very crazy. Like he is crazy. Uh, Masato Kinugawa, this guy found XSS and Google search box. When you search, if you write some his payload, you, you got uh, an XSS, which is, I'm not sure how much you got paid for this, but this is one of the most critical bugs. No one have ever thought that the Google search box is breakable, but he managed to break it. So this is the sniper approach. I am going to break this search box. Orange file descriptor, Nicolas, uh, Grigori, Franz Rosen, all these are very well-known names. They, uh, I think most of them other than Franz Rosen, so Franz Rosen follow a hybrid approach where he, do, he does the sniper approach and the other approach that I'll explain in a second. But most of these, they also do the other approaches, but I think 80% of their time, they focus on their sniper approach where they research and uh, they report the bugs. The reason why these are the top bug bounty hunters because you can see their work and you can understand how impactful this is. Uh, the other types are the recon masters or the, the brute force. So they're not going for that specific target. They are going for uh, find me the right tools they, to recon and find all the subdomains that belong to Facebook, all the subdomains uh, that uh, belong to, let's say, PayPal. They write tools to find XSSs, to find SQL injection. They are looking for the straightforward ones or the ones that are, uh, they can test it automatically so they can scale up and they can find uh, bugs in, in, in the bug bounty. So the skill set is different. They are writing, they are looking into writing codes and, uh, you know, being able to uh, scale themselves. Some of them, they don't write a lot of code, but they just test everything and they try to find the subdomains and they use existing tools uh, there. So this is the other type of the researchers. Uh, again, most, some of the popular names are uh, Mark Litchfield, uh, which under the handle of the bug bounty HQ, I think this guy managed to, uh, I think he had like create uh, $100,000 and or probably more uh, in, in one month or less than one month. I can't remember either $100 or 1 million in one month from Bug Bounty. Uh, Namsek uh, and uh, the Dogi G, uh, also all these are researchers that I think are mostly focused on reconning and making sure to find the weakest link and exploiting that. They still exploit that and they still show the impact of this, but most of the time they spend it on finding the weakest link on the website. If you have Facebook or if you have Google, I will find the weakest link there and I will go or I will find the security box there. Uh, some questions like how to start Bug Bounty. Again, you have the website, you can jump in there and uh, and just try to find security bugs there. Okay, now we have to the last part of our presentation or this webinar, which is the career. How can we link CTFs, Bug Bounty to the career? 
what are the different skill sets that I get here? If, I, if I'm someone who's new to the field, how can, should I play CTFs? Should I play bug bounty uh, or, or focus more into bug bounty? What should I focus on? Uh, so I'll try to answer this question from, uh, from the approach of, okay, let's look first into the careers, the different roles and the careers. What, what role do you want to work? And then look back into how CTFs would have helped you or how uh, Bug Bounty would have helped you in, in, in that career. So uh, <clears throat> so let's start with the roles. I, I divide the roles into two different types of roles, uh, offensive and defensive. So offensive is mostly about how to break. Uh, you talk about identifying vulnerabilities, mostly on a black box uh, approach. So uh, so if you work in a red team or a pen test, so you're mostly focused on, uh, you know, like finding security bugs from a black box approach. Also focus on how to weaponize uh, so how to write the exploit or write a full exploit uh, and a full stack exploit, which is slightly different than CTFs, and I'll explain this in a bit. So uh, mostly also when you develop the exploits, you look at the full stack of things. So you look at things like if you were, uh, if you have like a, a, a if you have a bug in uh, or you're developing an exploit a bug for Google Chrome. So you go into Google Chrome, you try to write an exploit for Google Chrome and then you jump into the machine and then you have a privilege escalation. So you're working now with a system. So it's a, a full stack view of, of the system of the of the machine basically and try to, 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 to write an exploit for that entire machine. So uh, example of offensive vulnerability researcher, uh, red team, pen test, exploit developers. So these are the different roles that if you want to work on the offensive part where I wanna break something, I wanna weaponize it or I wanna uh, exploit it, then uh, these are the different roles that you will be looking for. You can search for vulnerability researcher, red team, pen test, or exploit developer. So uh, the other approach is the defensive approach. Again, you should understand how to break uh, this this uh, software or this program, uh, mostly on a white box approach. So you try to, uh, you know, like read the code and try to understand the bugs or find the security bugs there. You don't develop full exploits, but you write pucks or something we call proof of concepts, uh, where you say, this is a SQL injection, and this is how I validate it's a SQL injection for you. You don't write a full exploit to read the user passwords or read the user's private messages or anything. Uh, the difference from the offensive here, you also expect it to know how to securely build that application or how to securely fix uh, the issue. and how to prevent it as well from happening again. So you can see the difference in a skill set. So in one side, you are trying to break, you are trying to understand uh, how to write a full exploit and weaponize that as an actual weapon to use. Where in the defensive side, we're trying to uh, find the bugs or find it and prove it is actually a bug and write a proof of concept for it, but then focus more into how to fix it and how to make sure it does not happen again. So the people who are on the offensive side cannot find this security bug. Uh, the, uh, the, the example of the roles here are application security engineer, network security engineer, malware analyst, incident response engineer. Again, there could be other rules or roles or uh, that, that are more on the defensive side, but I'm just trying to give an example of, uh, of, of the issues here. Uh, okay, what we're gonna do now is the relation between these rules and skill set. So on the left, you have the different roles that I mentioned. And on the right, you have uh, the, you know, like the different uh, skill set that you want to have to be able to apply for this role. So let's say you want to work as a security engineer at Facebook, what skill set that you're expected to have? Uh, if you want to focus on vulnerability research, what are the skill set that you're expected to have uh, to, uh, to, to, to participate into that, uh, into that program? So let's start with uh, vulnerability research. Uh, so if you want to be a vulnerability researcher, let's say, uh, second, sorry. Let, if you want to be a vulnerability researcher, uh, so let's say you are expected to do a code review you're expected to know fuzzing. You're expected to uh, know application security. You're expected to know reverse engineering. So if you want to be a vulnerability researcher, if you want to find security bugs in 
code, whether to weaponize them or whether to, you know, like to, to, to fix them. Let's not think about fixing, but just about finding the security bugs. So you need to know all these skill set. You need to be able to read the code, find security bugs. You need to be, able to, to be able to use fuzzing and understand how fuzzing works to find security bugs. You need to be able to understand application security, mobile, native, or web. You need to know also sometimes reverse engineering based on which area you will focus on. So if you know three out of these four, uh, you can be a very good vulnerability researcher. Okay, how can you get this from CTFs or bug bounties? So let's think. So on the CTFs, you can, we have seen that you have reverse engineering category, we have web category and you have pwnable category. So if you work on the reverse engineering category, you get this reverse engineering skills. If you work on the web category, you can get the application security skills on the web. If you work on the pwnable category, you can get the application security skills on pwnable. Also in the pwnable category, you can also use fuzzing and code review because some CTFs give you the actual code and you find security bugs. On bug bounty, it's you don't get a lot, uh, because you mostly focus on application security. Most of the bug bounty are focused on web or mobile. So you get the application security part, whether that's a web or mobile. Uh, the minority of bug bounties give you access to their source code. Uh, so you can actually do a code review and find the security bugs and you can do fuzzing and find a security bug. So you can work on Google Chrome and uh, or, or work on uh, you know, uh, either Google Chrome or they, it's open source, you can do fuzzing and you can do code review and to find uh, security bugs. But usually bug bounties don't do this because uh, let's say Facebook or Google, they have security engineer teams that who have access to the code, they know the code very, very well and they fuzz the code every single day to find security bugs and they review the code a lot to find security bugs. So it it's still, you still can do this, but in bug bounty, most of the people that I know in bug bounty and most of the people in the industry focus mostly on web and mobile applications to find security bugs, uh, bugs there. There are minority that focus on the code review and the fuzzing from the open source, but also the programs are slightly limited uh, there. So, uh, okay, pen test. If you want to be a pen tester or red teaming, what skills that you want to have? So uh, two skills, recon application security. So pen testing, if we're speaking, if we speak here mostly focus about application pen testing, not network pen testing. So uh, reconning because uh, reconning also helps for red teaming, but reconning because if you are pen testing a website or uh, or you are pen testing a company, you want to find all their subdomains, you want to find the the, the bugs in their web application or their mobile applications. Uh, let's see again how this is coming from CTFs and how is it coming from bug bounty. Uh, so. From bug bounty, the reconning and the web mobile signals are very, very strong. You are expected to do a lot of reconning. You are expected to find the weakest link. You're expected to find the security bugs there and report them. It's very similar to uh, the pen test role. And CTFs, you get you don't do a lot of recon. You don't do actually any of the recon, but you can get the signal of the application security for web or mobile. So if you only play CTFs, you won't be able to be, you will be a good pen tester, but you need to work on your recon skills. So if you do bug bounty, I think you will do very well with pen test, but you will learn a lot of recon uh, and you will focus also on the mobile applications. Uh, la and one more exploit developer. If you want to be an exploit developer, it's an offensive role. You write exploits, you, uh, you either you can uh, give the provide the exploit to the company that you work for if you work for something like uh, ZDI or something. But let's say the role exploit developer, regardless of where you work, you want to find the, to write to 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 write exploits for an application. So you focus on different things: exploitation techniques, native security, and system design. Exploitation because you want to know the different ways to exploit that. And here I'm focusing more on native security, but also web security. Uh, so you need to know the different way to exploit, whether that's a SQL injection, RCE, uh, or, uh, uh, or, or, you know, like uh, stack overflow, heap overflow, double free or native security focused. You need to know about system design uh, because once you write this, the exploit, you need to understand how everything works. Is this over the network? Uh, how this would go into the memory, the stack or the heap? How can I actually write my exploit uh, and to understand assembly? Uh, now, if we look into CTFs and bug bounty, most of the signal here are in CTFs. So pwnables are just native and they give you a lot of signal about exploitation. So you get the exploitation technique. 
Web give you a lot of, again, signal about exploitation, pure exploitation. It's a challenge. You need to find it and exploit it. You need to exploit that native security because of the vulnerable and the reverse engineering part. And it will make you understand that the design bug bounty doesn't give you a lot here because it's mostly focused on the web application part and not super focused on the native. Again, you can focus on the native, but I'm speaking about the general, the 80% of the rule. How does this work? Uh, uh, one more thing is malware analyst. I think this is the last role that I have. So uh, if you want to be a malware analyst, what the skill set that you want? If you want to work in Kaspersky, if you want to work on a Microsoft malware analyst team, uh, if you were, we have malware analysts at Facebook and Google have malware analysts. If you want to work as a malware analyst, what skill set that you should have? So these are the things that you will probably be asked for in the interview. So reverse engineering. You need to do code review. You need to be understand system design and understand forensics. So these are some of this or the main skill set that you need to understand if you want to work as a malware analyst. Again, let's look, let's look into how CTFs and bug bounty will help you to do this. So in CTFs, you have reverse engineering category, which directly relates to the reverse engineering that you are asked into in the interviews. You do a lot of code review as well, either through reverse engineering. So you you take the binary, you reverse engineering, or you decompile it. You get the code and you try to read and find security bugs in the code. So in the malware analyst, you also read the code or try to code review the malware, uh, the malware uh, code so that you actually understand what the malware is doing. Forensics, there is a pure category in forensics uh, in, in CTFs. In bug bounty, this is not relevant, relevant at all. System design and code fixes. If you remember the attack and defense uh, CTFs, you have the bug. Uh, you discover the bug, you fix it to make sure that other teams do not jump into your uh, uh, into your box or your machine. So all the signals come from CTFs or the different categories into the CTFs. Bug bounty is not very relevant, maybe could review a little bit, but there is no reverse engineering in bug bounty. Again, you can take uh, any product by the company and you can reverse engineer it and then you can find security bugs and you report it if you have their bug bounty project but that's not mainly what you know, like it's it's can be the focus of bug bounty but it's not the majority uh <clears throat> there is no forensics in bug bounty at all uh system designs in bug bounty there isn't because the team doesn't ask you how would you suggest a fix for this you can suggest a fix but you can never know if this is the right fix that they have created it's very difficult to do that uh all right so some differences now uh, i'm almost finished now so dump some differences between ctfs and bug bounty so uh some people say <coughs> uh, ctfs are they're not related to real world challenges and they are just superficial so you try to create the problem to make a challenge to people uh, but it's not related to real life uh, challenges that you will see while you're working or the bugs that you're trying to find one, I can guarantee you this is not the case. I have been working for Facebook as a security engineer for uh, three years and a lot of the knowledge that I learned from CTFs, I can I do use it on a day-to-day -day work uh, uh, and, and I, it helps me in breaking things and, and finding security bugs. Uh, but I can give you examples from the real world. So in 2009, uh, Andrew Danu, who's uh, part of uh, our team, LCBC, he was playing a CTF, the real world CTFs, and he found a bug in PHP, which has the CVE number and it's RCE on PHP. This is the, like, it's it's one of the crazy bugs that that, uh, that was found uh, and it's very, very impactful. And he solved the challenge with this, with this zero day. Uh, again, in 2019, uh, in Insomnia Hacked, a team found a CVE in Python GNU uh, PG. So this is for encryption and decryption. It's a very important package and it's a CVE, uh, it's a zero day there. Uh, again, things will keep coming. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's the same slide again. This is this is the exploit for uh, for for the, the bug that was found by Andrew. You can see you just send this link to the challenge or any service that's running uh, PHP with uh, fast CGI, I think. You can read more about the CVE and you get RCE on the machine. I will let you count how many machines do you think were affected uh, with that. So <clears throat> uh, the other, this is the Python one that I mentioned. Another also in Hetcon. Uh, Hetcon is one of the best conferences uh, for our CTF uh, competitions. In 2016, 
Uh, Orange is one of the best CTF players that I've mentioned earlier, uh, and also by Bounty Hunters. Uh, he created a challenge, uh, and that challenge was using the open source uh, PHP application called Sugar uh, CRM. And during the challenge, there were three zero days discovered. LCBC found one, Triple B found one, and uh, Psychokinesis found another one. So three zero days for a challenge that he didn't know they existed. It was not the intended solution. Last one in 2012, so this is even older, like we have seen 2012, 2016, 2019, and these are the ones that I'm aware of. Uh, 2019 and Basen, uh, which is uh, I think a Dutch team, also while playing a CTF, they found a zero day in PHP and they solved the challenge with that. <clears throat> so on uh, Google CTF, which is, watch this video, it's uh, for live overflow, uh, Google for Suet Bash. So in Google CTF finals in 2019, uh, one of the challenges to it bash for you to solve it, you need to find a zero day that the author found it, but I think the patch was was put, but I, I can't remember the details, but you needed to find a zero day to solve this. So this is how this is related to vulnerability research and how it's related to security engineer work where you try to find security bugs in, in the code. Bug bounty also, of course, like it's, completely related to uh, real life because you actually find bugs and you report it to the team and the companies and they get curious about this. But bug bounties are very, very good in finding different exploitation techniques. And the reason for that is that if you find different ways to exploit bugs and you can show the impact of this, you will get more reward, you will get more money. And that's what people focus mostly about. So better techniques to exploit than more money. So you can see here uh, something called cross-site leaks. So cross-site leaks are a type of bugs that was discovered around 10 years ago. No one cared about this until Bug Bounty Hunter said, okay, let's see how can we exploit this. Let's see how can we get the impact of this. Now, this is one of the streams that we get a lot in Facebook. Many people get a lot in different companies that they report. I think one of the biggest uh, submissions last week, uh, last year in Google was cross search XSS. Uh, so it's different techniques to exploit this. The Google search access, which as I mentioned, again, someone trying to exploit bugs with new techniques. Uh, there's also this very good uh, blog post about from Nahamsik about owning the cloud through server-side forgery. So SSRF is a very well-known uh, bug, but how to link this with AWS or other uh, cloud uh, providers to get the maximum impact, how to get from SSRF to RCE. And bug bounty hunters do very, very good on identifying the different ways to exploit and increase the impact because this means uh, more money. Uh, another thing is the reward, which is a big difference between CTFs and bug bounty. For bug bounty, you usually get a lot of money if you submit bugs and like the, the, the amount of money you get from bug bounty comparing to CTFs is a lot. So bug bounty looks like this, where you have, you know, you can get a lot of money and many people made millions from, uh, not many, but like, people made millions from uh, bug bounty, whereas in CTFs, you are mostly the cat part. So you do play, you solve the challenges, but you kind of, uh, you don't get a lot of money. Yes, if you win CTFs, you will get money and some competitions now started to pay a lot of money, but I don't think it's comparable uh, to bug bounty yet. So uh, the last thing in bug bounty is give you is a holistic view. So bug bounty focuses more in you have a very big problem. You have a Facebook website or Google website. You need to try to find the security bug. So again, as I mentioned, you do a lot of recon. You It's it's mostly a search problem. So 80% of your time is you're searching for the weakest link, for the weakest point, and 20% of your time are, are trying to exploit and make sure that this is the biggest impact. And it, bug bounty hunters are not, they're not expected to show this like impact every single time because once you report the bug, the researchers uh, or the company that you reported to are expected to tell you, okay, this was way bigger than what we expected and we will pay you based on the impact. So it, it looks like this. Do you see anything wrong here? Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, haystacks. Uh, and But bug bounty goal is to try to look into this haystack for the needle. So it's here. You still don't see it, right? So that's their goal is zoom in and actually see there, it's there, that's the needle, and that's what's the report look like. So there is a lot of effort in going through this haystack uh, and, and, and finding that needle there. 
whereas in CTFs is different. So uh, are you familiar with this machine? Uh, if not, search for Enigma. Uh, so this machine was used in the World War II uh, to, uh, by the Germans to encrypt the, the communication between the administration and the soldiers. And uh, this person here, Alan Turing, uh, was responsible on breaking the, the crypto of this machine. So if you think of now, this is a CTF challenge. You have this machine that you need to break the crypto for it. Once you create the crypto, you had the flag. The flag back then was very, very valuable because it stopped the war or managed or like tilted the uh, the side for, for the English uh, people uh, because they can they can now eavesdrop on, on all the communication between the German soldier and they know their plans. So that is but that's the challenge you have you have the enigma uh so sorry this is this the box yeah you have the enigma box and you you broke this uh or which is a crypto challenge and you're trying to break uh basically that is everything so uh in summary <clears throat> ctfs and bug bounty are different ways to gain different skill sets uh and based on the skill set you need to build up your uh you know your skill set box and using this for going for the professional uh, work or the career that you're going for, uh, you then you will match the skill set that you create, you, you, you gain from bug bounty or, uh, or, or CTFs to the role that you're applying for. If you're applying for a pen test, bug bounty will help you a lot. If you're applying for malware analyst, maybe you can focus on CTFs more. Uh, one last slide, which is my personal view on, on, on things. Uh, I, I personally tried CTFs and I have personally tried uh, bug bounty and uh, I I spend 80% of my time on, on CTFs uh, and I spent I didn't spend a lot of bug bounty so I, I, I spent three or four years doing bug bounty because I wanted to understand it or understand what the bug bounty is all about and I wanted to understand CTFs so I did CTFs for six years as well uh, for me from bug bounty, uh, you will get re very good reckoning skills. You will get uh, very good skills for if you have a very, very big problem, how you can break it apart and how you can uh, into smaller problems, how you can uh, focus on your toolings and how can you build your toolings to, to automate most of your work. Uh, and this was, was good for me uh, to, to also, you know, like uh, to try to think from a holistic uh, point of view. But <clears throat> 80% of my time in bug bounty was mostly about searching. So it ended up, it ended for me to be a search problem than a security problem. So 80% I'm searching for that needle. But once I find the needle, then I try to use it to kind of, to create an exploit or something. And I didn't enjoy a lot of like the 80% for searching. It's a very daunting process. It's a very, uh, for me, for personally, it's an annoying process, but I'm just trying to find the, the, the weakest link. Uh, where CTFs, you know, this is a weakest link, break it. This is a weakest link, break it. So you are testing your technical skills uh, and you try to testing how you are breaking uh, this, this piece of software or this application. So if we will say, for my view, bug bounty 80% search, 20% technical. If you are uh, doing the, uh, the, the, the you, if you are following the recon approach, not the sniper approach, uh, but CTFs are uh, probably 80% technical, 20% search. Uh, uh, and that's how you, uh, how I see the, the two worlds. What's most important, the two worlds are important. CTFs might make you very narrow-minded, might make you not being able to see the world from the bigger view. Uh, but, uh, and this is important when you apply for a security position role, a security engineer role, in my role, for example, we are responsible on Facebook products, everything in Facebook. So that's a very big problem that we're trying to decompose into smaller problems, which Bug Bounty helps. And uh, whereas once you work on, let's say, WhatsApp or WhatsApp security or WhatsApp VoIP calls or Gmail or something like this, then this is a smaller, well-defined problem. And you try to break this world application so you can use the skill set that you gain uh, from, uh, from CTFs. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's mostly uh that, that's it that's the last slide which is uh the questions uh so i hope the presentation wasn't too long and i hope you didn't sleep throughout the presentation i hope it was very uh 
uh, very, uh, you know, like enlightening or helpful for, for anyone who is joining the field or how is that very, anyone who is in the field and asking between the different uh, role, uh, roles. I, uh, you can ask me any questions now on YouTube or you can ask me on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, so you can, uh, you can ask me on Twitter, search for my name and just ask any questions. Uh, I have some questions already that have been asked for a couple, uh, two days. Uh, and I can try to answer them. I think one of the questions, I can also look at the phone super quickly. So one of the questions was related to how you manage your time between work and bug bounty and CTFs. Uh, it's very difficult to manage your time between the three, especially if you have a family as well, if you're married or you have kids. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, that's why I stopped doing bug bounty because I don't want to spend 80% of my time doing the search, and I, but I only want to focus on... Uh, the, the, the solving the technical challenges and sharpening my technical skills. So I don't do a lot of bug bounty, but I do CTFs. I don't do a lot of CTFs as I used to do before, uh, but I try to do CTFs on a weekly basis. There is no key magic of how do I manage my time, but the good things about CTFs is that you can just say, I will stay for six hours or four hours. I will work on one challenge and after that I will go and I will leave. And the good thing is that once I see, the good thing about CTFs is that after two days, the CTF is down, so you don't you you don't need to think of that be behind two days because the CTFs will be down and write-ups will be there. You can just read the write-up right away. But bug bounty, you will keep thinking in the back of your mind for how, where where do I find the bug? Okay, I didn't search for the subdomain. I need to look for the subdomain, or maybe if I upload the file with this extension, it will work. So it will keep always with you, which for me was tiring with work uh, and the search part. So I I do focus on my work and I do a little do a little bit of, of CTFs. I try to allocate some time for that. And I try to do a little bit of time for researching my own, uh, you know, following the sniper approach on CTFs. Uh, it didn't work a lot. It worked with me previously with Image Magic, but it didn't work a lot on uh, uh, like nowadays, I'm still trying to, to allocate the time for this. But my advice is like, set a plan of what do you want to do allocate time for this, start with something very simple, just one hour or two hours a day, uh, sorry, two hours over the weekend. Start with this and follow this and hopefully it works. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, that would be my advice. Okay, uh, for some reason, I don't see any comments, which means either there are no comments. Okay, now I think I can see them. Okay, so there are comments. Uh, but I still don't see them. Uh, okay, so uh, cool. So uh, questions I can't see. Uh, I really, I'm very terrible with this. So I can't see your questions, but if you can ask me on uh, Twitter, I'll do my best to answer. Uh, let me quickly check. I, I know a place where we had there is like four questions from people. So just give me one second and I'll look into them and I'll try to answer them. Uh, there is also for face in Facebook, there is a group called State of Security, which I manage and uh, it has, I usually uh, share things there. So you can also ask questions there. Yeah, so these are the list of questions there. So one of the questions had 63 votes. Pen tester mindset versus bug hunter mindset versus CTF layer. I think I explained this. Each one of them are different mindset and different skill set. Uh, bug bounty hunters focus on uh, the search problem on how can I find you know the the needle in the haystack. How can I find the weakest link? I don't need to go beyond that. Even you in, in bug bounty, you're if you find a SQL injection, you don't need to write the full exploit. You are actually not expected to write the full exploit. You're not expected to read user data. This will disqualify the bug so you you're not super focused on the exploit part but on the proof of concept part so uh bug bounty you try to find the needle in the haystack and in the ctf you're trying to break the problem completely build uh, an exploit for that and the exploit have to work because you have to get the flag one thing for people because there are many many researcher researchers that uh, I, I shared with you a list, list of a very good researchers. Try to follow this list and try to learn from them. I learn from them a lot, from their techniques, from their skills, from their knowledge. But uh, also, 
if you want to know if someone is a very book, a very good bug bounty hunter or not, read their write-ups. You know, if if you are a, book, a good bug bounty hunter, read the write-up. If they are good, they are good. If not, don't 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 worry about them. They don't think I don't think not. They are not necessarily good because you cannot tell if they found something because they are the first one who look into that. Maybe maybe Aquanetics or Burp Suite is the first tool that found this bug for them, and they just submitted the bug. They are literally just submitted the bug. So just if you can read the write-up then you can judge the person if not then you cannot judge the person and this is the different mindset the other question how do you manage your time we answered that already uh how security feels do you foresee hot in the near future uh <laughs> i think i think all security fields i think will be very hot with everything going to be digital everything literally uh voting elections uh health everything will be very critical uh, so <clears throat> i think two parts again thinking of offensive and defensive side so on the offensive side uh, i think we we already know like the electronic uh, like uh, countries already have this cyber war and uh, between different countries this will be one of the hot things so there there will be army of you know like uh, security engineers or attackers which already some countries do have uh, so this is something that the exploit development uh i think there will be a lot of requests on that when all the companies knows oh shit we're hacked all of us are hacked we need to defend this and secure this so security engineers will be very very hot in the near future exploit developers will be very hot malware analysts will definitely be very hot because again you will be hacked no doubt but you need to understand what happened how can remediate how can you fix this uh bug bounty hunters will always play, be a big part because this is an easy way for companies to get extra security uh so i think all the fields will be uh will be very hot uh it's just which part you really want to focus on what are the top bug bounty researchers we answered this and we divided the bug bounty into two parts uh snipers and recon masters Again, all the people that I've put their names there, I have read their write-ups. I know they are very good. Unless you can read someone's write-ups and you can judge them, don't trust what they're saying. Just if you can't see the write-ups. Uh, so uh, snipers are very good. The recon master are very good. I know Namsek. Uh, also in Egypt, we have Ibrahim Hagazi. He's very, very, very good recon master. And he also focuses on the sniper from time to time, but he's very strong in, as a recon master person. He found bugs in Yahoo, uh, PayPal, Google, uh, everywhere. Uh, so uh, what does the rating scoring of CTFs work? We, we spoke about this, the different scoring and rating uh, types. So scoring, we mentioned that uh, either static or dynamic or static with uh, bonuses, which is I hate. Uh, and uh, the rating for the entire CTF is basically is just an individual rating after the CTF went. Uh, go check out ctftime.org. You will have all the knowledge you need there. What are the differences between Jeopardy uh, and Attack Style? We answered this. So I think we answered most of the question on this poll in the state of security, uh, which is the Facebook group. If you have questions uh, about anything else, ask me on Twitter. Uh, I'll try to answer this. Uh, I cannot see my... Uh, the comments on uh, on YouTube, it, I just cannot see them. Uh, so, but yeah, thank you for everyone who watched the presentation, who lasted till the end. I know it's a very long presentation, uh, and I am waiting for your feedback and questions. Uh, and I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you, and have a good day, Ramadan Kareem.